Who was Dr. Royal Raymond Reif, and why are so many people still interested in the technology he spent many years of his life developing? In this documentary, you will learn about a brilliant and gifted man who developed the world's most powerful optical microscopes, which overcame the limitations of standard research microscopes, and who discovered a way to destroy deadly microorganisms using coordinative resonance. Though he died in 1971, interest in his discoveries did not. Royal Raymond Reif was a handsome and gifted young man. He had an inquisitive mind and explored many interests. He was born May 16, 1888 in the state of Nebraska to Royal Raymond Reif Sr. of Ohio and Ida Mae Cheney of Creston, Iowa. Dr. Reif was their second child, an older sibling having died in infancy. Ida Mae died, as so many young mothers did, about eight months after his birth. After her death, because Reif Sr. was working 14 to 16 hour days as a mechanical engineer, he took his son to his sister, Nina Culver Reif Dryden. She said about this difficult situation, I raised him and brought him up as though he was my own. He lived with her from the time he was eight months of age until the year 1905. At this time he had an interest in becoming a medical doctor and pursued this dream. He went to Johns Hopkins University to begin his medical training and after some study he found that he had a greater interest in the field of bacteriology. In bacteriology he did a great deal of work which included photographing many specimens for the University of Heidelberg. Because of the great contributions Reif made to Heidelberg University, he was given an honorary doctorate of parasitology in 1914. Because his studies of bacteria required intensive use of microscopes, Dr. Reif developed an interest in optics and began studying in that field as well. This interest led him to New York's Zeiss Works. Zeiss microscopes were world-renowned even at that time and Dr. Reif studied from 1904 to 1908 with Hans Leukel, the senior optics engineer. In 1846, Carl Zeiss set up a workshop for precision mechanics and optics in Jena, Germany. Twenty years later, he went into partnership with Ernst Abbe, whose theory of microscope image formation led to greatly improved microscopes. These innovations made Zeiss a world leader in optics and made it the logical place for Dr. Reif to study microscope and lens technology. With his scientific brilliance and knowledge of optics and bacteriology, Dr. Reif was poised to begin an incredible journey of discovery. This journey began with his move to California where he settled in Point Loma. Somewhere around 1912, Dr. Reif met and married his wife, Mamie Quinn. She was a wonderful wife who fully supported him in all his endeavors. Because jobs for bacteriologists were scarce, Dr. Reif took a job as chauffeur for Henry Timkin of Timkin Bearing. As his chauffeur, Dr. Reif became good friends with Henry Timken, and Timken became very impressed with Reif's knowledge. Dr. Reif had also become an accomplished machinist, and Henry Timken had a great love of racing boats. So he had Reif build the motor for his newest boat named the Kitty Hawk. This boat was built to compete in open sea endurance races of 100 miles. The motor Dr. Reif machine produced 2,700 horsepower, which was amazing for 1915. The boat went on to win the race, sustaining 87 miles an hour for 100 miles. This record was unbeaten for more than 60 years. Timken Bearing Company was a prominent producer of roller bearings, which were used in all types of equipment and are still used today. At about this same time, the company was losing a great deal of money because of defective steel. 
which was causing their bearings to fail. Rife developed the first X-ray eye capable of X-raying the steel and detecting hairline fractures in the metal. Rife developed this eye to scan across the full width of the production line and sound an alarm each time a flaw was detected. This saved the company millions of dollars. In appreciation, Timken gave Dr. Rife a lifetime stipend which he received in monthly payments. This made it possible for Rife to continue his work in bacteriology. Henry Timken's wife became ill. The many medical doctors who examined her were unable to discover the cause of the illness. Mrs. Timken's condition worsened, and they knew if they didn't find the source of the problem, she would not live. Henry knew through their many discussions that Rife was brilliant in the area of bacteriology. He asked if Rife would investigate. Rife suspected that the problem might be something she was eating, so he went into the kitchen of the Timken home and took samples of all the food. He had a few standard research microscopes and was able to isolate the bacteria responsible for the problem. Mrs. Timken fully recovered from her illness. One of Henry Timken's sisters, Amelia C. Bridges, who married into the Bridges Carriage Company family, also benefited from Rife's knowledge of bacteria. Through the years, she had many serious medical conditions and would only let medical doctors see her if Dr. Rife was present because she trusted so much in his expertise. When she died in 1940, Rife was devastated because he considered her to be a second mother to him. His close friends said that he shed many tears. Because of their long friendship, she left him an additional $50,000 to help with his research. As the family chauffeur, Rife and his wife lived above the garage on the mansion's premises. This is where he had his laboratory with all the research equipment. In gratitude for saving Mrs. Timken's life and the lives of other family members, the Timken and Bridges families provided funds to establish a more well-equipped laboratory and finance Rife's research. From 1915 to 1920, Rife worked in his private lab identifying and classifying disease-causing microorganisms. By the end of 1916, he was frustrated with the standard research microscope because of the limitations in magnification. Standard research microscopes at that time, like the ones today, could only magnify a microorganism up to 2,500 times diameter. Dr. Rife felt that with this limitation, he would never be able to find the true cause of many diseases. Rife began his work using frequency instruments in 1921. He told a reporter in a May 6, 1938 Evening Tribune article that he also experimented with electrical stimuli on the various microorganisms, and he noticed the individualistic differences in the chemical constituents of disease organisms saw the indication of electrical characteristics and observed electrical polarities in the organisms. Random speculation on the observation suddenly stirred in his mind a startling, astonishing thought. What would happen if I subjected these organisms to different electrical frequencies, he wondered. With this revolutionary thought, he began to gather all the necessary instruments such as microscopes, frequency generators, tubes, and bacteriological equipment, cages for guinea pigs, cameras, and machinery to build his own designs. Lee DeForest, the father of modern vacuum tubes, who was an important contributor to early radio technology, helped to build many of Rife's early frequency instruments. Rife found through arduous experimentation looking through the microscope as he applied various frequencies that he was able to kill these microorganisms, proving his theory to be correct. In order to determine which frequencies would kill a particular organism, it was absolutely essential that he be able to see the organism in a living state so that he could observe the effect of various frequencies. Dead microorganisms would show no effect. Rife later called the frequency which killed an organism its MOR, or mortal oscillatory rate.
The next step was to solve the problem of high magnification called the Fraunhofer diffraction limit. This theory was that no microorganism smaller than half a wavelength of light could be seen through a microscope. Reif knew from his many years of studying optics at Zeiss that it was possible to build a microscope which could see microscopic organisms as small as a virus. With this goal in mind, he went to work in 1917 and by 1920 produced the world's most powerful microscope. It could magnify with a clarity of 9,000 diameters. Dr. Rife said that this microscope could go clear up to 17,000 diameters, but not with any more clarity. Using this microscope over the next nine years in his private lab, he advanced further in the field of bacteriology than any scientist had ever done before. That instrument we used up until 1931. It was a lens microscope and all of the air was extruded from the body and replaced with glycerin. The lenses were homogeneous with glycerin all the way through the whole thing and the result was that in allowing the rays to separate and not cross in the interference band of reflection such as they do in the ordinary standard tube of the regular research microscope. We held them apart, we separated them and then brought them back together and picked them up again at a needle point. But as I say, the resolution of this instrument beyond about anywhere from nine to 10,000 times dropped off decidedly rapidly. We could go up on some occasions on some preparations up to 17,000 times, but we didn't consider the resolution anything out of the ordinary beyond about eight or nine or ten thousand times depending entirely upon the specimen we were examining. Through the 1920s Dr. Reif isolated many different organisms and was working on tuberculosis. He was successful in killing the rod form with his frequency instrument but like Bone and Robert Cook before him who were able to destroy the rod form of tuberculosis with vaccines and antitoxins Rife's laboratory animals also died. This caused Rife to believe that there was an additional virus that was released when the rod form of the bacteria was killed. In his continual search for a way to see viruses, Dr. Rife theorized that many microorganisms were not able to be seen because they were smaller than the molecules of the existing acid or aniline dye stain. Throughout his work, Reif had noticed that every living thing is made up of chemicals and has its own unique chemical constituency. In his lab, he had been using a spectrographic microscope that could identify the chemicals in an organism by the color refraction index. Knowing that each chemical, when illuminated, gave off a specific color of light, he conceived the idea of staining the virus with light. This dispensed with the need for staining specimens and made it possible to use a frequency of light to coordinate with the chemical constituents of the particle or microorganism under observation. He developed and patented the 2000 candle power lamp which provided the necessary light. This lamp, when used with the Risley prisms, made it possible to separate the specific frequencies of light. In an article in the June 1931 Popular Science magazine, the method of lighting was explained. An electric light of 2,000 candle power falls upon the center of this microscopic movie studio. A tiny spot on the thin slab of transparent quartz that bears the germs. Above it, 16 of the finest quartz lenses obtainable, immersed in glycerin, magnify the dimensions of each germ 12,000 times. Designed by Reif himself, this apparatus is one of the most powerful microscopes in the world. Its magnification compares with the 2,000 diameter enlargement of microscopes commonly used in research laboratories and in medical examinations. The November 21, 1931 LA Times had an article also explaining Dr. Reif's use of light. Due to the fact that images are borne to the eye by light waves measuring about one fifty-one thousandths of an inch in length, 
it has been supposed that no object considerably less than that in length would be seen by the human eye. By the use of quartz prisms, it is understood that Dr. Reif has broken up the light waves, making it possible to bring impossibly small objects to view. Through the new microscope, according to estimates, an object measuring one one hundred thousandths of an inch in diameter would be magnified to appear one-sixth of an inch in diameter. Another California newspaper article dated December 12, 1931, entitled, Newest Microscope Will Trail Unknown Germs to Their Lairs, says, Dr. I said that parts for his microscope were made in many parts of the world. He said he used quartz glass entirely because it allows from 48 to 50 percent more light than other kinds of glass. He said he uses a 2,000 candle power illumination unit with the instrument. The beam of the light is cold, he said, and he has had a living specimen under it for five or six hours without evaporation from heat. With this new capability of staining microorganisms with a frequency of light that coordinated with their chemical constituents, Reif was able to see the virus form of tuberculosis which was released when the rod form was destroyed. He was then able to find the frequency which would kill the virus. Although Reif worked quietly in his lab, word of his accomplishments began to leak out to men in the medical community. A reporter from the San Diego Union got wind of Reif's discoveries, and following an interview about his amazing microscope, an article appeared on the front page of the paper on November 3, 1929. The headline read, Local Man Bears Wonders of Germ Life. The article went on to describe photos of several microorganisms Reif had isolated and filmed. After this article, he was featured in many other prominent newspapers and magazines. As news of his accomplishments spread, doctors and bacteriologists from all over the world eventually came to San Diego to see for themselves the microscope and the new discoveries they had been hearing so much about. In late 1931, news of Reif's microscope had reached Dr. Arthur Isaac Kendall, professor of research bacteriology in the Northwestern University Medical School at Chicago. He contacted his friend, Dr. Milbank Johnson of Los Angeles, and asked if such a microscope existed. In the Los Angeles Times, dated December 27, 1931, the story of how Dr. Johnson, Dr. Kendall, and Dr. Reif met is told. Having heard about a wonder microscope said to have been invented by a young San Diegan, Dr. Kendall asked his friend Dr. Milbank Johnson of Los Angeles if such a microscope existed. Dr. Johnson did not know about it but undertook to find out. Accompanied by Drs. Alvin G. Ford, Joseph D. Heitker, 
and Fosdick Jones, all of Pasadena, he drove to San Diego and found Royal Raymond Rife and a new kind of microscope which he had been developing as a hobby during the past 17 years. Designed on a new plan entirely, this microscope has six quartz lenses, giving it a magnifying power eight times greater than the high-powered microscopes used by physicists. Dr. Milbank Johnson arranged for Dr. Kendall and Dr. Rife to get together at the Pasadena Hospital. This meeting between Rife and these doctors was an important milestone in his work. Dr. Kendall brought with him cultures of the typhoid bacillus which he had grown on his K-medium, a protein culture medium which he had developed. This medium enabled the filterable virus portions of a bacteria to be isolated and to continue reproducing without the need of living tissue for reproduction. There was and still is an ongoing disagreement about whether bacteria could change from a filterable virus sized form to the normal bacillus which can be observed through a standard microscope. I eventually built my first high powered microscope with that instrument. Arthur Kendall and I, working jointly in the Pasadena General Hospital, succeeded in isolating what we classify the first filterable form of bacteria ever seen. It was isolated from the bacillus typhosis from cultures that Dr. Kendall brought from his laboratory in Northwestern University in Chicago. And we succeeded definitely in isolating a filterable form of that bacteria. We succeeded in isolating this organism using a Kendall media. It's known as Kendall media. Now that is what Kendall used for the isolation or bringing out this bacillus typhosis in the filterable state, which is published in the Californian Western Medicine in 1931, our joint report on that. In an article in the Science Newsletter of December 12, 1931, it states, the material used by Dr. Kendall was a culture of the typhoid bacillus, ordinarily a fairly large germ, easily visible under the higher powered lenses of a compound microscope. By feeding it on his recently evolved K-medium, which apparently has the power of causing all visible bacteria to pass over into an invisible, filterable phase, Dr. Kendall induced the bacilli in his cultures to go through this change. Under the highest power of the ordinary microscope, he could see nothing moving in the fluid except a swarm of rather active little granules that were visible only as tiny motile points. Examined with the Rife microscope, however, these points became plainly visible as small, oval, actively moving bodies, turquoise blue in color. These appeared in all the cultures and could be transferred from one culture to another through the fine poured filters. So, Dr. Kendall considers them to be the actual filterable forms of the typhoid bacillus. Using Rife's microscope and Kendall's medium, the doctors were able to observe three stages of the development of the typhoid bacillus. This experiment showed that viruses and bacteria were capable of mutating or changing their form, a fact understood today but one which generated much controversy then. At a later date, they found the MOR frequency to kill the typhoid. From this point on, Rife's microscope and work received a great deal of recognition. He ended up working very closely with Dr. Alvin G. Ford, the pathologist at Pasadena Hospital, who later became president of the American Association of Pathologists and Dr. Milbank Johnson, then medical director of the Pacific Mutual Life Insurance Company. Dr. Johnson became Rife's most powerful advocate, introducing him to other doctors and making it possible for Rife to move his discoveries forward in a major way. Dr. Johnson was so impressed with Dr. Rife's work and the future medical implications of his frequency instrument, he held a dinner at his Pasadena estate in Rife's honor, which was billed as the end to all disease. In the back of the room by the window stands Dr. Johnson in white 
with Dr. Reif on the right and Dr. Kendall on the left. Among these doctors were Alvin G. Ford and Joseph Heitker, who had gone with Dr. Johnson to meet Reif at his lab. In the summer of 1932, Reif went to Chicago with his microscope to work with Kendall. Kendall invited world-renowned bacteriologist E.C. Rosenau of the Mayo Clinic's Division of Experimental Bacteriology in Rochester, Minnesota to come and use Reif's microscope. Rosenau had heard of Reif from a former patient of his who happened to be Henry H. Timken, the same man who had been financing Reif and his laboratory. Rosenau, Kendall, and Reif re-verified the experiments Reif and Kendall had done a few months before. I worked for Wish Road and all. He worked with me. I worked with him, whatever you call it, 14 years on polio malaria. He worked entirely on the brain function. He was the head of the Department of Research Bacteriology of Mayo in Rochester. And he said, they want me to scrap the work. I said, hold everything. So I was going back to work with Arthur, Arthur Kendall, at Northwestern University at that time. We checked on some of the previous work we'd done the year before. Dr. Reif had been working on finding the cause of cancer for many years and had long believed that when the cause of cancer was finally identified, it would be found in a virus or microorganism. He had spent many years looking for this microorganism with his microscope. He had sectioned 20,000 tissue samples with no success. Kendall's K-medium was exactly what he needed to help him find the cancer virus. An article in the San Diego Evening Tribune on May 11, 1938, told about the events that led to the discovery of the cancer virus in 1932. The reporter's article summarized what Dr. Reif said. But neither the medium nor the microscope were sufficient alone to reveal the filter-passing organism Reif found in cancers, he recounted. It was an added treatment which he found virtually by chance that finally made this possible, he related. He happened to rest a test tube of cancer culture within the circle of a tubular glass ring filled with argon gas activated by an electrical current, which he had been using in experimenting with electronic bombardment of organisms of disease, he recounted. It happened to rest there about 24 hours, and then he noticed that its appearance seemed to have changed. He studied and tested this phenomenon repeatedly, and finally one day he discovered filter-passing red-purple granules in the cultures. Reif called this organism Bacillus X or BX. He found that the organism was pleomorphic, and he named another larger form of it the BY. BX was for carcinoma, and BY was for sarcoma. He went on to isolate many other disease-causing organisms. The same article in the San Diego Evening Tribune on May 11, 1938 stated, Among the filter-passing forms he reported isolated were those for cancer, although he frankly declares that he is not yet positive that this is the direct cause of the dread disease. B. coli, the seemingly harmless bacillus, which always seems to accompany the harmful typhoid bacillus. Tuberculosis, sarcoma, the tumorous disease similar to cancer but less deadly, infantile paralysis, streptococcus and staphylococcus infections, and herpes encephalitis and encephalitis lethargica, both infectious ailments of the brain and nervous system. Success in the search began to come when Dr. Arthur I. Kendall head of the Department of Research Bacteriology at Northwestern University Medical College, joined him in a phase of the work and suggested a culture medium 
which proved to be a phase in making the hitherto unseen viruses visible. In later years, Reif's research made him certain that he had found the viral cause of cancer. Many other doctors who came to Reif's laboratory in the early 1930s also believed he had. A July 31, 1949 article in the San Diego Union said, Mankind's long search for a cancer cure may be in sight as the end product of laboratory experiments conducted in San Diego 15 years ago. These experiments and the discoveries they yielded are credited to Dr. Royal R. Reif, 62, of 3676 Zola Street, a laboratory technician now retired. This announcement was made here yesterday by James B. Couch, M.D., a San Diego medical practitioner for 18 years. Dr. Couch also said, he also visited Dr. O. Cameron Gruner, former director of the Archibald Cancer Research Fund at McGill University, and discussed Gruner's recent work in cancer research. He recalled that Gruner made several visits to San Diego 14 years ago to study reported discoveries by Dr. Reif of a virus connected with cancerous tumors. Gruner told Dr. Couch he was satisfied that Dr. Reif's large microscope for which Reif claimed 25,000 areas magnification, had revealed a virus. He said further that the work he then did with Reif at his Point Loma Laboratory and follow-up researches at McGill University had confirmed that tumorous growths positively could be produced by the virus discovered in San Diego. Further on in the same article, Reif was quoted as saying, when Dr. Gruner came here to study my experiments, he brought with him a fungoid organism. Dr. Rife said, I was able to reproduce this same fungoid organism by virus, which I had classified as BX. I was also able to distill my virus back from the fungoid organism. I produced cancer in hundreds of animals. I completed the cycle from virus to cancer and back 104 times. I discovered that the virus organism gets in the blood of the victim at one stage of the growth. As far back as 1920, I conceived the idea and the possibility of when the causative agent of malignancy, so-called cancer, would be discovered and found and proven that it would be caused by a microorganism. Of course, reception that I received that far back from the medical profession and scientist was nil. But I kept at the work, and I succeeded in eventually isolating a virus. First, I began sectioning tissues of every known type of malignancy. I sectioned over 20,000 of those cut them down with a special mycotome to very thin, some of them were only a micron in thickness. I studied those under the microscope and I eventually built my first high-powered microscope for the purpose of analyzing and checking those sections. Arthur Kendall and I, working jointly in the Pasadena General Hospital, succeeded in isolating what we classify the first filterable form of bacteria ever seen. Now these filterable forms are very minute in size. The smallest of all is the one from the BX, which we isolate from cancer. But that is the smallest and it's less than the one twentieth of a micron in dimension and highly motile. We succeeded in isolating this organism, this BX, using a Kendall media. Through the 40 years that Rife spent researching microorganisms and developing all kinds of equipment to aid him, he won 14 government awards for scientific discoveries and an honorary medical degree from the University of Heidelberg. During this period, he developed and built five virus microscopes, four of which were prismatic. His first microscope, built in 1920, used round quartz lenses and the gaps in between were filled with glycerin. He used this instrument up until 1933. The others he built after this were the prismatic type 
using block crystal quartz that obtain much higher magnification. The most sophisticated one is his number three microscope, which was called the Universal Microscope. This microscope was the one mentioned in the previous article that had 25,000 areas magnification. The Universal Microscope was built by Dr. Reif in 1933. This was and still is the world's most powerful light source microscope. It is reported to be capable of going as high as 61,000 areas magnification when special prisms were used. The electron microscope, though more powerful in magnification, kills the specimens so you can't observe their live reactions. In many cases, a fragile virus will be completely destroyed by the electron bombardment and all that will be left is debris. The universal microscope, like all of Dr. Reif's microscopes, allows observation of living organisms at varying magnification. The Journal of the Franklin Institute of February 1944 gave an in-depth description of the universal microscope. The universal microscope, developed in 1933, consists of 5,682 parts and is so called because of its adaptability in all fields of microscopial work, being fully equipped with separate substage condenser units for transmitted and monochromatic beam, dark field, polarized and slit ultra illumination, including also a special device for crystallography, the entire optical system of lenses and prisms, as well as the illuminating units are made of block crystal quartz quartz being especially transparent to ultraviolet radiations. The illuminating unit used for examining the filterable forms of disease organisms contains 14 lenses and prisms, three of which are in the high-intensity incandescent lamp, four in the Risley prism, and seven in the achromatic condenser. Between the source of light and the specimen are subtended two circular wedge-shaped block crystal quartz prisms for the purpose of polarizing the light passing through the specimen. A monochromatic beam of light corresponding exactly to the frequency of the organism is then sent up through the specimen and the direct transmitted light, thus enabling the observer to view the organism stained in its true chemical color and revealing its own individual structure and a field which is brilliant with light. The objectives used on the Universal are a 1.12 dry lens, a 1.16 water immersion, a 1.18 oil immersion, and a 1.25 oil immersion. The rays of light refracted by the specimen enter the objective and are then carried up the tube in parallel rays through 21 light bends to the ocular, a tolerance of less than one wavelength of visible light only being permitted in the core beam. The rays start their eyes parallel to each other, but just as they are about to cross, a specially designed quartz prism is inserted which serves to pull them out parallel again, another prism being inserted each time the rays are about ready to cross. Thus the greatest distance that the image in the universal is projected through any one media, either quartz or air, is 30 millimeters instead of the 160, 180, or 190 millimeters as in the empty or air-filled tube of an ordinary microscope. Under the universal microscope, disease organisms such as those of tuberculosis, cancer, sarcoma, streptococcus, typhoid, staphylococcus, leprosy, hoof and mouth disease, and others may be observed to succumb when exposed to certain lethal frequencies coordinated with the particular frequencies peculiar to each individual organism and directed upon them by rays covering a wide range of waves. Because the universal microscope had the ability to use all type of microscopical work, it was very complicated. It cost over a quarter million to build in 1933 equaling a little over eleven million dollars today. This instrument along with the other sophisticated instruments Dr. Reif built made it possible for him to find the many frequencies that would kill all the different types of microorganisms which he was isolating.
The universal microscope embodies all the field of polarized light. It embodies all the field of crystallography. It embodies the polarized light, the true polarized light of the petrographical micropolariscope. And it embodies the field of refractability. And we believe that this instrument will open fields that have never been seen before by the human eye. We do not say that the average practitioner or even the average research scientist can use this microscope. He will have to be trained because the delicate adjustments of this instrument far surpasses anything that's ever been wailed in the field of microscopy. As an example, the fine adjustment of this instrument requires seven complete revolutions for the movement of the object one micron. The control of the thing is built to the limit of human precision. And we will carry on farther with this instrument. What I wish to stress at this moment is the importance of the control of the illumination of any field of microscopy, regardless whether it's the ordinary microscope that's used by our student or the practitioner or the research man in the laboratory or the scientist that's working in the field of filterable virus. This color chart was created by Dr. Reif to show the entire spectrum of frequency waves he was testing, including infrared, ultraviolet, and x-rays. He assigned colors to different sets of frequencies from the audio range represented by the keyboard all the way through the radio spectrum up to the 110 megahertz. Though in his frequency instruments he never used a frequency higher than 20 megahertz on any microorganism, he found through his research that there were many different harmonics of frequencies that would kill the various microorganisms. This is an original film showing Reif's lab in the isolating of the cancer virus. This is Royal Raymond Reif standing outside the front door of his laboratory. When Reif isolated the cancer virus in 1931, he took an unulcerated human breast mass from the Paradise Valley Sanitarium and Hospital, donated by Dr. R. T. Hammer, who was the assistant superintendent. Portions of this tumor were cut out and filtered through a triple aught porcelain Birkfeld filter, which gave about 10 micron filtration. The virus could readily pass through a filter of this degree of tolerance. The test tubes that are shown here were irradiated for 24 hours with argon gas. This irradiation caused the virus to become virulent. Reif could then grow tumors in weeks instead of months. The argon gas ionized the virus and to counter this, the test tubes were placed in a 2 inch water vacuum and heated at near body temperature for 24 hours. This method of ionization and oxidation brought the chemical refraction of BX out of the ultraviolet and into the visible band of the spectrum. Every time one test tube disappears, it means there's an elapsed time period of 24 hours. The rats were injected with a very tiny needle from the virus that he had filtered and isolated and the tumors were allowed to grow to be two or three grams heavier than the rats. Here Reif shows the injecting of the cancer virus into the rat. The mammary gland was used in the rat because cancer virus came out of the mammary gland of a human breast mass. The rat was given a partial anesthesia to avoid the shock of the needle because such a shock was found to cause a change in the rat's metabolism. The virus was then injected into the rat. Reif would then allow the cancer tumors to grow. Here you can see the large tumor in the rat. He would surgically remove the tumor and treat the rat with his ray tube instruments the frequencies would devitalize the cancer virus without harm to the animal cells or to the rat. Reif used special glasses with high magnification during his operations. 
in order to perform the fine details of the tumor removal. The tumor is tied off and cut away. The cancer virus can again be isolated from that tumor and then injected into other rats. Reif went through this procedure 411 times to prove that the virus he isolated was the cause of the cancer tumor. This shows the tumor coming out of a solution of triple distilled water. A portion of that tumor is being cut away so that you can observe the cancer virus under Reif's microscope. Reif had the only microscope in the world that could see the cancer virus or any other virus alive and he studied them for years. This is triple distilled water going in and he is going to gently grind up the cancer tumor to extract the virus. This is a porcelain Birkfeld filter similar to unglazed Dresden china. The liquid material is poured into a test tube and a drop will be removed from that liquid which Rife will shortly place on a slide that has been flame sterilized. The liquid material is withdrawn from the solution using a micropipette made by Rife and a drop is placed on the slide and covered with a cover slip made of quartz. Reif used quartz slides because light passed through better than glass. Now the ray tube is directly above Reif's head, which will be turned on later to kill the virus. The black instrument to the left of Reif is the ray tube instrument and consists of a transmitter which Reif could tune the frequencies which he knew would kill the virus just like an opera singer's voice can shatter glass. Now these are the first pictures ever made of the cancer virus. These cancer viruses were motile and streamlined shaped like a fish. Rife will now turn on the ray tube instrument which will activate the ray tube. If you look carefully at the ray tube you will see a little flash that only lasts about a second and that will be all that is needed to kill all the virus under the slide. This shows the virus after it had been treated with the ray tube which has a resonant frequency that killed the virus and they are all clumped together in the field of the microscope. From 1931 to 1934 Reif worked very closely with Dr. Milbank Johnson and Dr. Arthur Isaac Kendall and other prominent medical doctors isolating disease-causing microorganisms and finding the corresponding frequencies which would kill them. For years, Reif had been testing the frequencies first many hundreds of times on cultures grown in petri dishes for each microorganism. On the cancer virus alone, he had inoculated 411 lab animals with this virus, created 411 tumors proving that the BX virus was the cause of cancer. Then he used his frequency instrument on many of the animals to eliminate the tumors. By 1934, Dr. Milbank Johnson felt that it was time that they should use the frequency instrument on terminal patients. Dr. Reif was hesitant about working with human patients at this time and only agreed to do it if Dr. Johnson could arrange for a research committee headed by six of the top medical men in the United States. Because Dr. Johnson was a prominent man himself, well respected and a medical politician, he had the capability to do this. All these men were at the dinner hosted by Dr. Johnson in 1931. This group of men included Dr. George Fisher, Children's Hospital, New York, Dr. Whalen Morrison, Chief Surgeon, Santa Fe Railway, Dr. George Dock, Dr. Arthur I. Kendall, Director, Northwestern Medical School, and Dr. Alvin Ford, President of the American Association of Pathologists. He also wanted the medical committee to be under a legitimate university. 
Dr. Johnson arranged for the University of Southern California to sponsor the research committee. With all these requirements in place under Dr. Johnson's control, the clinic of 1934 was ready. Now they would see if the instrument would work on terminally ill patients who had no hope. The clinic lasted approximately 70 days and was held at the Ellen Scripps home near the Scripps Institute Annex in La Jolla. At the end of the 70 days, the research committee pronounced 14 out of the 16 patients clinically cured, a success rate of 87.5%. The remaining two patients had not fully recovered by the end of the clinic, and Dr. Johnson chose Dr. Couch to finish up with their treatments. Sixty days after that, those patients had completely recovered as well. One sad note is that one of the patients who had recovered from the cancer gorged himself on sardines and other food. He had an adverse reaction and it caused his liver to swell and rupture at the place where the tumor had been. Dr. Couch said the autopsy showed he had hemorrhaged to death but there was no evidence of any cancer. We had a clinic in 34 in La Jolla, Dr. Novak Johnson, a friend of mine, that was uh, in Los Angeles when he was one of the big uh, brands of the Pacific Mutual Life Insurance Company, a monomillionaire. Incidentally, he was a medical politician, and he had the big whip. He could kind of throw these boys in shape a little bit. And uh, so we had this clinic. I didn't want to go in, but he said, all right, let's go ahead. That was just shortly after the Helen Scripps died out there, and he rented a whole Ellen Scripps home. We run a clinic out there. We were there 90 days. We actually run a clinic about, uh, oh, I would say 70 days. We did actual clinical work. And first I told him I wanted it done in a legitimate order. First I told him, I said, I want you to surround on this committee with us a group of six of the biggest men you can pick in the United States. I said, you're a politician enough, you can do that, which he did. We got Fisher of New York, we got Waylon Morris, we got George Dox of Pasadena, and so on. And I said, I want as our pathologist, I want Alvin Ford, which is a friend of both of us, of course. But he says, good Lord, he says, uh, you look to the thousand tissues to Alvin one. It doesn't make any difference. I said, he is the president of the American Association of Pathologists. And I said, I want his name on every one of these cases we treat. Now I said, I want you to organize a special medical under a bona fide university, which we did under the University of Southern California, which Dr. Johnson contributed their library and so on and so forth. Like he carried a weight there too. We did it. We run the clinic. We got through. We did all reports, photographs before and after this that, and the other of our 16 cases we had. At the end of the time when we had our meeting, Los Angeles uh, Athletic Club up there, why? Absolutely solid. And I thought, 
Because of the success of the 1934 clinic, several doctors acquired the frequency instruments and began using them on patients. Dr. Milbank Johnson acquired a frequency instrument and used it in his clinic until his death in 1944. Other clinical trials were done in 1935, 36, and 37 and later, and the success rate in those clinics was around 90%. In these clinics, all kinds of conditions were treated. The instrument used in the 1934 clinic had its origins when Reif began his experiments on the effect of frequencies on microorganisms. A paper found in Dr. Reif's files, written by one of his lab assistants, and entitled Development of the Rife Ray and Use in Devitalizing of Pathogenic Microorganisms explains the evolution or advancement of his frequency instrument. In January 1920, experiments were started to determine the effect of electrical influences upon pathogenic microorganisms. Tests were made for anode and cathode polarity influences and the effects of infrared, ultraviolet and x-ray. The initial apparatus for the tests along this line of experiments was constructed and used in prolonged experiments during 1921 and 1922. In 1923 a more appropriate apparatus was assembled and used. The different frequencies were generated by a tube oscillator with many stages of amplification, the final stage being a 50 watt tube. This simplified frequency was in turn fed into an output tube. The output tube was constructed with a double expansion bulb blown from quartz using a platinum anode and cathode. It had a 45 degree target for a directional effect. The frequency control of the instrument was exact to a fraction of a wavelength making it possible to coordinate the frequency in each pathogenic microorganism with its own wavelength of frequency delivered from the instrument. During the next eight years these experiments continued and the coordinating frequencies termed mortal oscillatory rate or MOR of most of the pathogenic microorganisms were found and recorded including the frequencies of many of the virus or filter passing forms of these organisms. In 1935, an entirely new application of the old principle was incorporated in an instrument built under the direction of Rife by Philip Hoyland of Pasadena, California. The new instrument was light socket powered and had an output of 50 watts. Furthermore, it was equipped to deliver two distinct frequencies simultaneously and both variable. In the early part of 1936, Reif and Hoyland spent much time collaborating on revising some of the fundamentals of the instrument due to the advancement that had taken place in electronics. And it was found that the carrier wave used in the previous instruments could be eliminated. During the summer of 1936, further experiments were carried on which resulted in an entirely new method of generating the desired frequencies. By 1937, several men, including Philip Hoyland, Dr. Couch, and Ben Cullen, a longtime friend of Rife, came to Dr. Rife with the idea of starting a company that would have the right to build and sell the frequency instruments to doctors worldwide. Rife, after much consideration, decided to go ahead, and Beam Ray Corporation was born. The company initially built 14 instruments, and they were sold to medical doctors. Most of the doctors were happy with the results achieved by the instruments. However, two of the machines which were shipped to doctors in England did not work as promised. 
Philip Hoyland had been contracted by Dr. Reif and the University of Southern California Medical Committee to build Reif's instruments in 1934. As an electronic engineer and the technical director of Beam Ray, he was supposed to make sure the instruments worked properly. He did not fulfill his agreement. As happens so often with new successful inventions, there were many wanting to be a part of this endeavor. One such man was Dr. Morris Fishbein. He tried to buy in through his representatives in Los Angeles. His offer was turned down and he used all the power he could to try and get control of Beam Ray. His representatives met with Hoyland who at that time was dissatisfied with his part in the company and offered him $25,000 to help get control of the company. Subsequently, a lawsuit was brought by Philip Hoyland against Beam Ray Corporation, alleging that the company was not able to meet its financial obligations and that the board of directors should be dismissed and he should be put in control. It was found in the court proceedings that the AMA through Fishbein was attempting to take control of the company. Beam Ray won their case, but it left them penniless after the legal bills were paid. The judge in the case offered to represent Beam Ray in a suit against the AMA, but because they were financially bankrupt, it was impossible to pursue legal action at that time. Ironically, it is possible that if Fishbein had been able to get control of Beam Ray, he would have paid Dr. Reif only a royalty, and the instruments could be in every hospital today. After the trial, Dr. Reif went back to his research work in his laboratory. Penicillin was the first antibiotic to be discovered and put on the market. Many doctors were more interested in giving their patients antibiotics than looking at using an instrument which would use frequencies to destroy organisms. Antibiotics were seen as a panacea that would solve all of mankind's health problems and enormous amounts of money were being poured into their development and into the pockets of the doctors that prescribed them. Under these circumstances, the interest in Dr. Reif's technology began to fade. Use of Reif's discoveries from 1938 to 1944 continued quietly among a few doctors who had his frequency instruments. In 1940, Mrs. Bridges, who had been donating to Reif's research laboratory, died. The money from Henry Timken was no longer there. Dr. Milbank Johnson died suddenly in 1944. His influence had made it possible for the doctors to use the frequency instruments. With his death, pressure was put on these doctors to use antibiotics, which were considered the conventional medical treatment for disease. They were told not to use the frequency instruments anymore. Rife eventually closed down his lab. In 1950, John Crane came to purchase a drafting set that Dr. Reif had to sell. Crane became interested in the research that Dr. Reif had been working on. By 1953, Dr. Reif, John Crane, and John Marsh formed a company called Life Labs, Incorporated, and began again to try and reintroduce the instruments to doctors. Antibiotics and many other drugs were not giving the results that had been anticipated and new doctors were more willing to take a look at Rife's frequency instrument. During this time, John Crane and John Marsh began working on a revolutionary new smaller portable frequency instrument that would be less expensive than the current ray tube instrument. At that time, the ray tube instrument cost $7,500, which was equivalent to the cost of an average home. Even doctors found it expensive to purchase. The smaller frequency instruments eliminated the need for a ray tube by using pads that came in contact with the body to deliver the frequencies at a fraction of the cost. Because these instruments were smaller and came in contact with the body, they didn't need to have the same power as the ray tube unit. Due to cost and size, the RF carrier frequency portion that Dr. Reif normally used was left out to see how well they would work. Preliminary tests were encouraging, but the results were found to be extremely limited without the RF carrier frequency portion. 
Scientific tests have proven why Dr. Rife's use of an RF carrier is so important. It takes at least one megahertz to penetrate and go through the cells in the body. Frequencies lower than one megahertz were found to travel only through the connective tissue between the cells. Therefore, any instrument should have and use one of Dr. Rife's carrier frequencies, which range from 2.4 to 4.6 megahertz. In spite of all the encouraging results, the same pressures experienced by doctors after Dr. Johnson's death came into play again. In 1962, Life Labs shut down after a court battle. It appeared that Dr. Rife's research would be lost forever. Rife said that he had put his life and his fortune into this work with no monetary compensation, had finished it and handed it to mankind on a silver platter but none of the people in positions of power wanted it. In 1971, Dr. Reif died, and the world lost an incredible mind. In January of 1986, Barry Lines wrote an article about Dr. Reif. John Crane contacted Barry Lines and asked him if he would help get the knowledge of Reif out to the world. Barry decided to write a book, and in 1987 published his book, the cancer cure that worked. A new interest in Rife's great work then re-emerged and is spreading rapidly worldwide. Just the fact that you are watching this documentary is evidence that Dr. Rife's life and work were not in vain.